Thank you for listening and uh, I'm going to talk about diagnostic imaging for eye care professionals. Uh, this is the outline of the course. Uh, I'm going to show you what are the tools of orbital imaging and then show some anatomy and pathology and show you some neuropathology, uh, neuro-ophthalmology pathologies and then I'll show you how to use us, modern diagnostic imaging, how to can you best utilize us. So basically I have a uh, different modalities uh, for you to order uh, x-ray, the ultrasound, CAT scan, MRI, and the angiogram. Uh, pretty much uh, in practice is the CAT scan and MRI. Uh, x-ray, which also called a plain film, is uh, pretty much to evaluate any foreign bodies before patients have MRI just to be safe. So a metal in the eye is not safe for the study. So uh, the cross-sectional imaging is what uh, we use every day to evaluate the orbit. Uh, first, I have to give you a definition of uh, what is orbital imaging about. Uh, in the axial plane, this is the axial plane, then you can cut through this from bottom to top. You can see the eyeballs and the brain. And so axial view is patient's tip is inside the brain and its foot is towards us. So the patient's left side is here and is to our right side. As a coronal view, same thing. Patient facing us, this is patient's left side, this is our right side. Coronal view. Cutting through like this. Sagittal view usually start from the left to right, but uh, when I scroll back and forth, uh, I have to tell you where I'm at. Uh, so it's easier to call this way. So ultrasound is not that uh, used uh, nowadays in the United States, in the but in the correct uh, hand, they can be very useful. Uh, they can. Uh, this is eyeball. You can see a lesion beyond, beyond the eyeball. With color doppler, you can see a blood flow to there. and. Uh, this is correlation by MRI that uh, showed this is a tumor, meningioma, in the uh, optic uh, around surrounding the optic nerve. Uh, so I'm going to show you a thyroid cyst uh, with some debris that floating inside, uh, moved by this ultra ultrasound wave. What I'm trying to show you is uh, the ultrasound does deposit some energy into whatever is uh, image and can move little particle inside the eyeball, if there is any. Um, here is the, uh, here's the cyst, and this here is the vein, uh, this is the thyroid gland, and then the, the color are the blood flow around the cyst. Inside the cyst have a little particles. So they're particles, they're not blood, uh, but they move uh, by this ultrasound wave. And some of the uh, particles move fast enough that uh, the uh, ultrasound can detect it as a moving subject, so it will show some colors. But the gray stuff are also particles that move. So take a look. Like snowing, huh? So basically, ultrasound can see through cystic lesion well, but also can deposit some energies. In practice, this is CAT scan versus MRI. CAT scan is pretty fast nowadays, a high-speed uh, CAT scan. This patient is going to have a, a CAT scan of the, uh, uh, of the abdomen and pelvis, which covered a much bigger area than the, uh, the brain coverage. And so still, it only take like 10, 20 seconds. So you can take a look. And then here's the CAT scan technologies console. And you can see the um, first machine is going to have a uh, voice control telling the patient, that, hey, girl, uh, hold your breath. When the patient holding the breath, that the move, and then the cats can start moving, and then the image gets generated, and you will see the image popping up in in the console. Okay. So the brain should be even shorter. MRI, on the other hand, take about uh, 
five minutes or so each sequence, and usually like a five or six sequence. So it takes about half an hour. Uh, but uh, here, the CAT scan have radiation. The MRI doesn't have radiation. Here are the uh, comparison charts for uh, CT versus MRI. Um, so I will talk about it later. The co CT costs less than MRI. MRI is safer for the body because there's no radiation. MRI is good for soft tissue, and CT is good for bones. Bony pathology, CT. Soft tissue pathology, MRI. Um, quicker for the CAT scan, uh, and uh, uh, not much limitation for a CAT scan. MRI, you have to rule out to make sure the patient doesn't have a, a metal implant or car pacemaker or any uh, metal in the eye, which I just showed you. This is a CAT scan result. This is the MRI. Both have uh, the same patient uh, lens replacement, uh, lens implant. This is lens implant. It's hard to see the soft tissue, but uh, you see the bone really well. You see the septation and the sinus pretty well. On the MRI, the sinus is hard to see and bone is hard to see, but you can see the soft tissue, mucosa of the nose well, the lens implant well, and brain parenchyma better. Now I'm showing you some uh, orbital anatomies. Uh, so basically, the location is key. Uh, we in the in the bony orbit, we have a muscle cone, a cone-shaped muscle that surrounding the uh, eyeballs and the uh, optic nerve and optic nerve sheaths. Inside the muscle cone is called an intraconal space, and the muscle cone and the extra conal space is outside the muscle cone and inside the bony orbit, and then the, this orbital. Uh, Location. So basically, uh, depending on the lesion location, uh, we can find out uh, its causes uh, easier. Um, so the eyeball uh, have a three layer in the back. The most uh, important layer is the retina layer, the retina, which detect the uh, light. And the uh, retina is part of the brain that's protruding into the surface of our body, which is formed as an eye. Uh, the next layer is the layer, which is supporting, uh, provide vascular support to the retina. And then the next layer down is sclera, which is a thick, tough layer for protection. And that is pretty much contiguous with the dura uh, in the brain. So uh, literally, it is a brain tissue that protruding into the front of your face, form an eye, you know, dragging along a tough, uh, protective uh, layer is called op uh, optic nerve sheath, which is the same as the sclera. Um, the uh, muscles are here, the fat. Uh, this is a cranial nerve, which is also called cranial, central, uh, cranial nerve 2, which is optic nerve. The vision going through here. Here are the paranasal sinuses. Here is the pituitary infundibulum. Uh, the optic uh, visual pathway, uh, I don't have to uh, review too much, uh, you all understand it pretty well. The half of the uh, information cross in the uh, optic chiasm, uh, once they pass beyond the optic nerve, uh, they cross half, 50% cross in the midline, and then they go to uh, optic track and uh, optic radiation to the occipital lobe, which is controlled the vision. And this is the visual cortex in the occipital lobe. Uh, the previous one is the anatomy uh, 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 illustration. This is a MRI of a uh, nine months baby. That uh, there is a special imaging technique called a tractography. With basically, we, are, we can image the white matter track that uh, from the optic nerve back to the uh, occipital lobe. Here is a decussation of the uh, optic chiasm. Uh, this patient has a tumor here that uh, shown the, the the nerve is displaced by this tumor and also traverse and going through the middle of this tumor. Um, this is an 83 year old lady that have a dense and vitreous hemorrhage and near total vision loss of the right eye. This is acute view just like this and cut cutting from bottom to top. Paranasal sinuses and uh, bilateral eyeballs extraocular eye muscles, normal eyeball, rounded shape, lens has been replaced both sides, and hemorrhage, V-shaped hemorrhage, uh, lifting the retina layer off the uh, where it belongs in the back of the eye. So 
and we can see the brain function well and blood vessels uh, and uh, I'll show you some nerve we can also see pretty well so in basically an MRI we can learn a lot about the orbital and periorbital anatomy okay, here are the uh, ophthalmic veins and this is the ophthalmic artery so for orbital imaging, the cranial nerve 2, 3, 4, 6 are very important. 2 is vision, and 3, 4, 6 are controlling which direction the eye ball is turning to, uh, very, which is very related to the vision as well. Cranial nerve 5 is also uh, very important. And they move the, uh, uh, they have sensory, the green uh, sensory fibers, and uh, one of uh, one of the uh, the mandibular nerve have um, a motor control the muscle uh, mastication. Facial nerve also control the facial muscles. The uh, the muscle get that close the eyelid is controlled by facial nerve uh, facial nerve which is cranial nerve seven. So that's also related to vision. Let's so show you the axial view. Uh, this is from top bottom to top. Uh, cranial nerve seven and eight going to the middle ear and that's uh, again hearing and balance this is cranial nerve 6 abducens nerve uh, you can see it well and uh, cranial nerve 5 is a big one they're going to the uh, face um, now I'm going to show you some uh, pathologies first we can see some uh, abnormal shape of the uh, lens I'm sorry uh, abnormal shape of the uh, eye globe the eyeball normal shape that's abnormal shape there's a little bulge here it's called a coloboma. And this person, the, the shape of the eyeball is not round. It is kind of a uh, buckling uh, in the of the sclera wall in the medial part. It's called a staph a staphloma. Uh, there is uh, this patient have trauma. The eyeball is not rounded. So there is a deformity here, and the patient may retain vision, may lose some vision. But this patient definitely will lost his left eye vi ball vision because of there is a bullet fragment that ruptured the eyeball. This patient is 18 year old, played with BB gun, shot a bullet in six feet. Bullet exploded, and then part of the bullet that ruptured his eye eyeball. And um, this is a uh, the lens is not in the right location. Normally the lens is right in the middle of the anterior part of the eye and here is dislocated and this one is uh, so dislocated that's ca called complete subluxation of the lens that's uh, as if the patient was looking inward towards himself but really this lens belonged to here just like the other side um, and they said there's corneal uh, injury at some time sometime where we were referred to evaluate for uh, corneal abrasions. For example, this one uh, patient, there was a foreign body that lodged into the uh, eye, and uh, we don't know what kind of foreign body it does. Uh, see, CAT scan can look for them, especially metal or wood uh, that contain air. Wood usually contain air, so we can find them. Uh, plastic is hard to find. And uh, this patient has a, uh, a corneal laceration, and then the anterior segment, the fluid had leaked out and the lens was dislocated and moved forward. And this is an 85 year old lady with a calcillary muscle calcification. And uh, sometimes the lens calcification can just look like that. The calcification just move more into the lens and there is uh, associated vision loss. And this patient have, uh, now that we're moving towards the uh, uh, uveal layer, the retina. There's uh, inflammation, you can have it retinitis this is a, a AIDS patient and then the retinitis uh, retina is pretty vascular so sometimes a patient with metastasis can, can uh, metastasize into uh, the retina uh, or a young patient that they can have a calcification in the back of the eyeball that, that uh, you guys will see a leukocoria that's uh, a sign of a tumor this is a retinoblastoma basically this showing the, uh, the retinal hemorrhage that elevate the uh, retina and separate the retina from the choroid layer. Um, you can put oil, or you can put air in there, or you can put oil in there to push the retina back to 
treat this retinal detachment. Um, there are other kind of uh, hemorrhage, uh, it's called choroid hemorrhage, which happens right between the choroid and sclera. The hem hemorrhage is right here. The shape will look like this. If the hemorrhage is right between the retina and the uh, uh, choroid, uh, they will be look like this shape. And then if there is patient that's uh, on anticoagulation, have minor trauma, and they can uh, have hemorrhage into the eyeball, into uh, the, uh, the vitreous portion. Um, here's a, a, a busy slide. Um, it's basically showing uh, the difference between pre-septal cellulitis and post-septal cellulitis. And ba the bottom line is uh, the pre septal cellulitis is uh, treated uh, in outpatient setting. The post septal cellulitis is more serious and uh, need to be treated inpatient and uh, need uh, aggressive treatment by anti IV antibiotics, not, not only by mouth. The antibiotics have, they have to go through the intravenous. The, key, the main reason is uh, the vision is at risk when the infection is going behind the eyeball. The septum is hard to find. Uh, here is anatomy. Uh, picture. The orbital septum is right here, the bone to the eyelid. But in, in practice, we do not see that little uh, uh, line that we pretty much use the equator of the eyeball as a uh, landmark. So anything in front of it is preceptal. Right here is half uh, equator, so anything behind it are postceptal. This person has uh, orbital cellulitis from uh, ethmoid sinus disease that's spread into the orbit. patients have uh, Graves disease and uh, they are there's autoimmune disease via in intraconal um, inflammation including uh, enlargement of the uh, extraocular eye muscle and the fat is result in uh, too much volume behind the eye and pushing the eyeball out. Uh, the patient would have trouble even closing the, uh, their eyelid. This is uh, one of our patients that uh, I did a uh, CAT scan, uh, three-dimensional reconstruction images so pretty much like this. Uh, uh, web picture. And by the way, this patient has a big goiter. So they have uh, usually 20, 30 year old lady that uh, have grave disease and it's called a thyroid eye disease. Uh, this is normal. And this is abnormal. Normal because of eyeball relative to the eyeball socket, the eye orb only orbit. And this uh, eyeball is way out. It's called proptosis or exomsalmos. Um, uh, th thyroid eye disease doesn't have to be symmetrical. It can be uh, more prominent on one side than the other side. Um, and it doesn't have to have a uh, abnormal thyroid level at the time of, uh, of examination. So uh, that makes it very confusing between this uh, entity, uh, thyroid eye disease, and uh, another entity is called uh, uh, orbital pseudotumor, which is called uh, idiopathic orbital inflammatory disease this disease also have uh, inflammation in there and also have proptosis. They all have infiltrative uh, uh, process and they are all autoimmune. The key, the difference is uh, painless uh, symptom and here is painful. This one is uh, muscle enlargement with sparing the attachment and this one is uh, involvement everywhere. So, um, but they are treated both by steroid anyway. So. Uh, keep going. And this patient uh, is norm, uh, normal eyeball and normal optic nerve. This normal optic nerve head is flush with the back of the eyeball. And this patient doesn't. A 30-year-old lady that uh, the optic nerve is protruding into the eyeball. So uh, on your examination, you will find a papilledema. Not only that, uh, you will see the optic nerve sheaths, with pretty much the coverage of the nerve, are distended by the CSF. Uh, signal. Uh, this is normal. It doesn't have much f uh, fluid between the nerve and the sheath. Uh, this is a sign of intracranial hypertension. Idio uh, the, we call that idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Pretty much a term that replacing pseudotumor cerebri. It usually happens in obese young ladies mm, that have persistent headache. Uh, the theory is they have abnormal CSF absorption, making, t making normal amount of CSF for cerebral spinal fluid and they do not absorb it. So they have too much pressure in the brain and then they're reflected as uh, pressure distending, uh, the fluid is distending the, uh, the, uh, the optic nerve sheath and the nerve are pushing into the eyeball. 
just like uh, this case. This is a literature case, and their uh, lumbar puncture pressure will be high. Uh, I'm showing you some normal uh, MRI coronal uh, Im anatomies. Uh, here is a, a coronal MRI with a uh, superimposed uh, uh, anat uh, uh, anatomy diagrams. So basically, we can see uh, what the anatomy diagram shows. The, all the extra ocular eye muscles, the ophthalmic vein, uh, the uh, central artery of the retina uh, is difficult to see. Uh, the sup uh, superior, uh, the ophthalmic uh, artery can be seen, and uh, we can see the fat well. We can see the brain parenchyma well. We can see the mucosa well. Um, here is a, a coronal view, cutting from front to back like this, from front to back. The medial rectum muscle is controlled by cranial nerve 3, right here. This is the cranial nerve 3 that join into the muscle, and you can follow this cranial nerve 3 back, follow my uh, tip of my arrow here, back towards between the superior, uh, superior cerebellar artery and the posterior cerebral artery right here the nerve back going back into the uh, brain stem. So basically that nerve uh, is pretty much a, l a little bit bigger than the hair and then here's the uh, cranial nerve 5 that have so many nerve fascicles, each one of them pretty much hair size. So our m modern MRI can see a lot of pathology and anatomy. S uh, just for you. Uh, I will show you how um, how good images that nowadays we can produce and uh, we can pretty much uh, see uh, anything larger than uh, one millimeter. Uh, this patient uh, is an 11 year old patient looking at us have calcification in the nerve head and that uh, uh, patient that was referred for questionable intracranial mass uh, or aneurysm. It turned out there are calcifications that mimic papilledema in this uh, young patient. This is another patient basically showing the same finding. It's a calcification of the nerve head, re uh, optic, uh, optic nerve head. Uh, here is a patient that in September 2007 came over for MRI for some other reasons. I do not remember, but uh, have the op superior ophthalmic vein mildly dilated. But he came back in uh, 2011. This nerve vein is much more dilated. 2011, 2007, 2011. So basically, this patient developed very costly of the superior ophthalmic vein. And just, uh, just the same pr principle as the leg uh, varicose vein. Um, so, uh, because of the superior ophthalmic vein, a valve has been destroyed, and this is a result. Uh, this is from Wikipedia, uh, that uh, when the valve doesn't work, the flow is not one direction, can flow will be bidirectional, can flow back, so the vein has to have too much volume, uh, distended by uh, too much blood, and so you can, you can see the very costly. And the same thing in the eyeball. Sometimes varicosity can press on the optic nerve. Uh, this is a, a, a another case, um, is, which is a multiple sclerosis case. A multiple sclerosis patient have um, inflammation in the optic nerve. It's called a optic neuritis. Uh, this patient has a acute loss of visual acuity in the right eye and the left eye have a chronic loss of visual acuity. This patient uh, used to have inflammation of the left eye. After it's burned out, means and once the inflammation calmed down, the damage has been done, the left side of the nerve is shrunken. Uh, it's no longer inflamed now, but it's uh, s small size is small, and you lost the visual acuity. Visual acuity. The right side is more active, it's being being burned right now, basically, being inf uh, is active inflammation, active Im inflammation sh showing up as contrast enhancing uh, portion of the vein uh, of the nerve. And normally, the nerve and brain does not enhance because they have a blood-brain barrier. 
when there's inflammation there is breakdown of this barrier and we will see enhancement that's why we'd like enhancement um, images to see where are the active disease um, so this is a uh, in the middle is normal for comparison and uh, in the bottom and the top of the same patient that's showing the uh, optic nerve is abnormal uh, sometimes the patient was referred to rule out uh, uh, optic neuritis or some kind of a intracranial disease that turned out the patient have a meningioma this patient have a meningioma that enlarged the bone and then the bone and the meningioma soft tissue that narrow the orbit orbital content and compress on the nerve so uh, this uh, this is another uh, possibility that could cause uh, postal exophthalmos this patient has um, skin cancer the skin cancer like to spread along the nerve along this hitchhike on this uh, cranial nerve uh, five the mandibular branch into the brain normal f CSF filled ca ca cavity it's called Meckel's cave and this one the nerve is uh, the tumor is hitchhiking into the brain and then the nerve because the nerves destroyed the n whatever this nerve innervates the muscles have a abnormal signal as compared to the normal side so we can uh, find the nerve injury we can find the result of the nerve injury which is muscle edema can find where the nerve uh, goes, where the tumor goes. Um, this is a normal anatomy in the same place, a normal patient, and the normal f uh, nerve that's going down to the uh, infratemporal fossa. A lot of, uh, see a lot of fascicles, they are all cranial nerve 5. Here they draw like two separate nerves, even though they, they are really, in, in reality, they are just a whole bunch of little nerves that can clump together. This is cranial nerve 3 screen nerve three right here the artery the artery so pretty much uh, nowadays uh, our MRI is very much like anatomy book uh, two patients with pituitary lesion that compress on the optic chiasm this is a uh, solid pituitary tumor that compress on the right side of the chiasm uh, this is cystic tumor that compress in the middle of the chiasm the classic teaching is a uh, tumor compressed in the middle of the chiasm result in bitemporal hemianopsia. Um, but this one obviously would not be bitemporal, will be more affected uh, on the right side. So um, we see that uh, frequently. Here's the normal chiasm, here's pituitary stalk. If there is a lesion here going up, we're going to press on the stalk, uh, press on the uh, optic chiasm. Uh, this patient, uh, to, oh, to show you, this cranial nerve 3 is, uh, is damaged. Cranial nerve 3 come right out between these two arteries, between the crutches of these two arteries, and then right near a place, uh, right here, between this artery and this artery. There's some, uh, there's a, a part of the brain called uncus. When there's a mass on one side compressing on the brain, this uncus was herniated will be herniating out. It's called uncle herniation. This herniation is compressing right here on the cranial nerve 3. That's why when you do eye examination they will have a, a ptosis that uh, there's levator palpebrae uh, muscle is not really working and so the eyelid cover half of the eye which normally should not cover the pupil and then um, if it's c compressed this cranial nerve 3 further even the pupillary reflex uh, will be gone. And this patient still have the reflex, but uh, the muscle doesn't work now. This patient have a, a trauma. Uh, this is uncle herniation case. So uh, the uh, eye examination will reveal a lot of uh, about uh, intracranial pathology. Uh, now switch switching gear to um, traumatic injury to the orbital region. This is an 18-year-old uh, baseball injury, right hit, hit right over the left eye. And uh, the when the eyeballs get pushed posteriorly, have nowhere to go, some kind of bone usually gives and fractures, and so have make some more room for the eyeball. And for this for this patient, is the the floor of the bony orbit is, is where it's fractured. Um, 
we can, for that patient here, we can remove the skin and uh, remove the soft tissue. We can see the bone that uh, this part is fractured right here. It's a, it's a gap between these two parts of the bone. It shouldn't be no gap. Um, this is an alcoholic patient that uh, had broken the uh, right eye, the, bottom, the floor of the orbit, and then also the nose. Uh, and this patient is a police uh, uh, trainee that uh, met a large partner partner and it, uh, and it got an elbow to eyeball and then showed a, again uh, orbital blowout fracture the floor of the orbit was broken lucky that's only fat herniated out and the muscle wasn't uh, entrapped so if the muscle wasn't entrapped so the moving the eye should not be a problem so not a surgical uh, case uh, if the eye if the uh, uh, muscle is entrapped then the surgery is needed to mobilize the eyeball so uh, the patient can uh, look uh, uh, in one direction using both eyes looking in the same direction otherwise we'll have double, double vision another patient wrestling uh, the uh, eye elbow to eyeball uh, where the, this is the medial the, mid the medial part of the uh, orbit was broken uh, fat is herniating into the sinus and uh, again, it doesn't contain the, uh, the muscle and the uh, eyeball is okay. And sometimes patients probably even don't even go to the emergency room. Uh, later that uh, patient come over for the mother's reason, a headache or something, we did a CAT scan and find out, oh, and there was an old injury that this part of the bone was uh, uh, broken before. So uh, I, f I see that frequently. Another four year, a 14 year old trampoline injury, a knee to the eyeball, this patient, this upper part this orbital roof is broken and this fracture right here so uh, sometimes the orbital apex can have, have fracture but this area is very critical because the optic nerve going through right right here so the little injury a patient uh, have decreased vision in the right eye okay now switching gear to uh, angiography Angiography, this is our angiography room, this is biplane, and the t monitor here, patients stay here, so x-ray going from shooting from below or from shooting from side, so basically we're trying to study the vessel in different directions. Uh, this, they're not, we're not us using angiography for diagnosis much nowadays, uh, usually for problem solving uh, or doing any invasion from treatment. Um, because it's invasive and could cause complications such as a hematoma through the groin area where the catheter is going through the body and get to the brain. And so we don't uh, really go to the angiography unless we are have high suspicion of some uh, particular vascular lesions. For example, this patient, uh, patient has acute stroke, cannot talk, and, and the patient was transferred to the emer em, uh, emergency room quickly. And the uh, CAT scan showed uh, uh, a blood clot right here. Normal blood, uh, this is CT angiogram. The normal blood flow should be flowing outward. Here is cut off because there was a blood clot here. And so the doctor uh, did an angiogram with the purpose of trying to open up the cl blood clot. Inject the uh, contrast here and see the vessel well here. Stop right here. Um, and then the doctor's uh, interventional radiologist got the catheter in there and uh, using different kind of technique to take the clot out. So while they are working on the clot, you can see there's some blood flow restored already. And then after thrombolysis, uh, the colysis the clot, and the patient get the, blo uh, the um, blood returned back to the brain, and the patient start talking on the angiogram table. It is that dramatic. Um, so this is good happen a happy case, and this uh, after throat clot, uh, after clot was removed, it's like this. Before, after. And there's the patient with the left eye and right eye and the skull. So basically, it's all subtracted out. So the only thing that visible is are the vessels. This is called angiogram. We can do that angiogram uh, non-invasively with MR or CT, which I'm showing you right here. See first and. Um, in uh, the artery, artery part is enhanced and getting enhanced even more and even more and when the uh, contrast going through the brain parenchyma move into the venous phase uh, the vein is shown more 
and then going back to the heart. So basically showing you uh, again artery, arterial phase, beginning of venous phase, venous phase, venous phase, drain it back to the heart. And this is a patient that uh, we can uh, remove the skin and soft tissue to see the the vessels in the brain. This is a MR venogram. We can study the venous structure well as well. And uh, we can rotate the um, intracranial uh, venous uh, sinuses around so we can see where there are maybe clot or maybe malformations. We can really evaluate them really well. This patient has a um, carotid cavernous fistula. Uh, because the, uh, usually they're traumatic. Uh, basically, it's a, a direct short, a short circuit, a circuit of artery and vein without going through the, any parenchyma. Usually, um, artery go from the heart uh, to the tissue, go through the capillary phase, and go back to, through the vein, back to the heart. This one is go directly from artery to vein without going through any uh, tissue capillary bed. So the result is uh, the vein is taking too much blood volume and have nowhere to go and then causing the eyeball to pop, uh, protruding out. And you can hear some pulsating uh, epiphthalmus. If you occlude the carotid, and you will hear the uh, pulsation decrease. Um, and, and this is a real uh, case. 16-year-old uh, after trauma, uh, and there is a connection between artery and vein. The vein is getting so large that compared to the normal side, it's w much larger. And then the connection is here's the artery, here's the vein, here's a little connection that uh, from the tra uh, from the trauma. Now, doctor get angiogram in there trying to block this communication, so the vein is no longer enlarged, the, so the eyeball would not pop. Out. And here's the difference between the traditional angiogram. You can see the a vessel much in, in much detail, even more much more detail than our MR angiography and CT angiography, uh, but it's uh, invasive. So we can help them to find where the lesion are, and they can go in there and do further uh, evaluation and uh, uh, treatment. They can put a, some kind of a blocking material, uh, either a clip or a balloon, to stop this communication of this uh, fistula. Um, th again, this is a patient I show you, the sphenoid meningioma that is causing ephthalmus that uh, the referring clinician have clinical question of carotid cavernous fistula. Okay, uh, this is a uh, interesting case. Uh, it's current case. The patient is still in the hospital. Uh, last month's uh, patient, a 42-year-old female without past medical history, woke up one morning and could not open one eye. Ophthalmologist has suspect cavernous sinus thrombosis and the right eye have complete vision loss with lack of pupillary light reflex. This is a patient um, with bilateral uh, eyelid swelling and then this is CAT scan reconstruction of the same patient at the same time. And this is MRI, axial view, eye this is eyeballs and face, nose in front, and tip of the head is into the screen and foot towards us. You have multiple skin uh, infections, pus. This uh, one, two, three. This one corresponds to this one. This one corresponds to this one. There's a bigger one, the subcutaneous abscess here corresponds to this one. So at least uh, uh, multiple abscesses because of the vein are uh, uh, the of the inferior balsamic vein and a lot of other veins are does not have valve, they can flow either way. So they could spread this uh, infection into the brain, which this patient did. So um, the infection going through the sinuses into the cavernous sinuses. Uh, the sinus was in thrombose, clotted because of the uh, infection and inflammation. And the uh, have patient had uh, meningitis and uh, the eye both uh, Intraorbital and extraorbital soft tissue are inflamed. And the eyeball is proptotic uh, and stretched. The optic nerve is stretched. I think a combination of stretched optic nerve and inflammation result in uh, a damage to the nerve. Uh, uh, and this patient lost the vision, vision of his her eye, right eye. Um, 
same patient, the inf inflammation even spread to the carotid artery. So the normal carotid artery is this wide. If this patient have the had basically inflammation of the artery, and then the artery could get narrow and further narrow and could thrombose, and the patient would have a large stroke. So it's a very serious disease. And uh, so patient was uh, put on triple antibiotic for infection. Uh, turned out to be later turned out to be methicillin resistant staph aureus. Uh, high dose steroid for vasculitis. Anticoagulation for this thrombosis of the uh, structures of venous structures. Eight days later, I still have further progression. The pa but this is eight days later. Uh, the right side eyelid swelling is still there. You can see the vein is dilated. The left eyelid swelling has gone down. And this is a, a, cas a cascade reconstruction of the same patient at the same time. The left side uh, abscess has been drained. Um, so uh, on surface, the patient has been improving. but uh, the inside the eyeball and then around the eyeball the venous uh, clot is uh, progressing. Anyway, um, now I'm going to talk about the neural ophthalmology. Basically it's a beyond uh, the, um, the orbit. This is uh, what I uh, deal with every day and I'll show you some cases here. This 30 year old female with six nerve palsy I have double vision uh, right greater than left. Um, this is a MS plaque. This is MS plaque. Which I showed you that uh, uh, the multiple sclerosis plaque is they are pretty much inflammation in the white matters um, that uh, del um, delay the nerve trans uh, transmission of signals. Uh, frequently they are happening in the, the uh, paraventricular region and supratentorial region. It doesn't affect the vision the visual pathway. But this one turned out to be in a bad location that for this patient that affect the cranial nerve 6 nucleus right here. Pontal medullary junction region right here. Uh, right here. This is normal patient for comparison. Normal should be normal signal. No wife signal here. This is abnormal signal. So patient have double vision right greater than left. The clinician suspect abducen nerve injury. Turn out that's uh, exactly fit. This is a MS plaque affecting the nerve uh, nucleus. Uh, this is another patient that doesn't, does not have visual symptom, but I'm just trying to show you that multiple sclerosis plaques, they pretty much like a burning uh, process. In day one, they're burning in the middle. The, outer, uh, the peripheral part is uh, less, uh, less uh, infl inflamed. Day four, the f inflammation getting bigger and get moving outward. Day eleven, the inside they pretty much burn out, and then outside is actively burning. Burning means infl inflammation. Inflammation means they destroying the myelin sheath that's going through this area. Uh, that the patient, whenever they uh, need the signal, they will go through this area slowly and doesn't go as fast. Uh, so the symptoms is uh, very variable. The uh, patient was treated with steroid and th the inflammation calmed down and then the size getting smaller in 32 days and then by a in a year in the middle part that was burned out bec that becomes cystic and later collapsed become this. The outer part that uh, was trying to burn out but c controlled by the steroid shows some half burned gliotic scar tissue. So this is what uh, multiple sclerosis plaque uh, uh, look like. Uh, this is a bigger plaque and the smaller plaque is hard to hard to tell the, the anatomy because it's so small. Uh, basically they're burned through uh, near a this medullary vein. Anyway, uh, we see a lot of MS, we see uh, a stroke a lot. This patient, a 50 year old the right hand man with a stroke, he saw in when he woke up a a thirty. He saw snowy vision in his left eye, uh, left visual field, and um, numbness in the left uh, lip and le left arm we witnessed. So uh, a CAT scan of this patient showed normal CAT scan. MRI showed a stroke in the occipital region on the right side. By the way, CAT scan cannot see acute stroke well, and then MRI, uh, MRI is excellent for detecting stroke. And then 
we can find out we did the uh, MR angiogram find out the vessel on the right side is undulating irregular as compared to smooth left side so that's probably what's causing the patient's uh, ischemia to the right occipital lobe this is a carotid ultrasound to show this patient's uh, neck vessel is also abnormal pretty narrow and only 50 year old uh, you see the patient lost a lot of teeth so have had a tough life and uh, uh, age, aged faster than other people's another patient this patient uh, is my uh, MRI technologist uh, mother uh, she had been dragging her uh, right leg and hip and uh, and uh, she kept complaining about hip problem and then uh, my tech, uh, MRI technologist kind of encouraged her to see a doctor and later find out she have a, a lesion in the brain on the left side the left side of the brain control the right side of the body uh, fit perfectly this is a benign lesion it's called an arachnoid cyst uh, but anyway if you say that's a meningioma it will be treated the same anyway uh, so this the mass effect of this lesion is causing the symptom so we have to find out uh, where is the central sulcus that's a certain question because uh, they want to find out oh, where to cut this is a patient this is a lesion where is the central sulcus because the near the central sulcus are the important um, a part of the brain that control the m sensation and motion uh, you want to avoid that and this is the doctor a surgeon's uh, estimated motor area right here uh, he was planning to go on the sideway or post uh, posteriorly to drain the cyst uh, but uh, we did a uh, uh, functional MRI uh, that sh that we can find out where exactly is the motor area? We did a uh, patient's uh, right uh, left hand, right side of the brain. We find out this is the um, area of controlling the finger. Uh, we told the patient to do finger tapping, and then uh, patient was think about finger tapping and move the finger, and that result in increased blood flow to the brain that control the finger part, and then we can uh, detect that extra blood flow and convert it into color. So basically, this is a, uh, controlling the uh, uh, patient's left finger, and uh, this is a patient's uh, motor area controlling the right side uh, finger. So knowing this area is important, and the, the change doc uh, changed the surgeon's approach. He changed uh, the approach from f uh, from front to back. He's gonna at attack this lesion front to back like this, and um, we can also find uh, tell the surgeon that where are the white matter fibers relative to this loca uh, this lesion and then how can we uh, plan for the uh, surgery without injuring too much white ma matter fibers for example here is it the same patient's uh, uh, white matter fiber tracking that we can see uh, where the where the brain area and then the white matter fiber that going down to the uh, arm and leg here is this so we can show in different directions and then uh, it's very helpful for the uh, neurosurgeons and this is a, a tumor the patient have a multiple tumor this is how we do the white matter fiber tracks that looks pretty cool change the color of the uh, fiber to basically to color code it uh, front to back is green, the left to right is red, red uh, up and down is blue um, so pre-op this is our motor area and this is the lesion post-operate post-operation the cyst has been removed mostly and then the uh, hand area the finger area is still in the same place on the patient's uh, uh, right uh, side of the brain and then the left side is because the pressure is gone the, the cortex kind of bounces back where it should be before after before after 
so patient has a good response and then patient reported no, no symptom in uh, several follow-ups uh, now so almost from 2009 to 2012 uh, three years of no symptom perfect uh, uh, result you can see the um, uh, doctor used a frontal approach and that put a catheter in there keep draining the whatever leftover fluid there um, n now I'm going to talk about how to order uh, diagnostic imaging Basically, this is the part that you guys should pay attention because I'm not teaching you how to read MRIs uh, at core CAT scan. I'm just trying to how to order them. Uh, that is, uh, will be your good order, and um, my good images will work together to help with uh, help patients find out the pathology. Um, so, basically, what I recommend is the ACR accredited uh, facility, uh, 64 slide CT, three Tesla MRI and a subspecialized read for your studies uh, means a neuroradiology to protocol to basically protocol means to tell the MRI technologist or SCT CAT technologist how to scan the patient and to how to interpret the images um, the ACR accreditation is pretty much a sta uh, they have a standard that American College of Radiology that uh, they have to fit certain standard to get this accreditation. Uh, as, as at least that's a minimum uh, bar that you have to pass. Otherwise, uh, uh, nobody wa really watching the facility's uh, quality. The best uh, CT and MRI nowadays in 2012 are 64 slide CT and 3 Tesla MRI. Basically, the better machine uh, means the, the group, uh, the radiology group, care about the image quality, which turn usually translate to better services. A larger group usually they c we can specialize to read a different part of the body by certain people, and that usually result in better reading. Uh, CT versus MRI. I just showed you uh, all the pathology. Basically, the CTs for trauma and bone fractures or read the foreign body. Uh, everything else, inflammation, infection, mass, or disease, MRI is good with contrast. Uh, but in, if that patient's in emergency set setting, to get it studied faster is uh, you usually order a contrast enhanced CT. Um, I will show you some cases like this. Patient has a, a right optic nerve swelling. Uh, Ruan mass. Uh, we find a mass easily it's right here. This is normal uh, nerve, and extra ocular muscle, and yeah, here's a, a, gl a gray glob of tissues here. It's hard to tell that uh, is this uh, tissue is pressing into the nerve or is coming growing out of the nerve, pushing on the uh, the muscle. Is it uh, displacing the nerve this way or is it surrounding the nerve? And this all the things that we want to know that will help us to tell what kind of tumor it is and also help the surgeon how to cut it out. So this is non-contrast CT, it doesn't help. Uh, this is contrast study. Non-contrast, contrast. Non-contrast, contrast. contrast. The contrast show you this is nerve in the middle, the tumor is surrounding it. Uh, so basically you can see the anatomy much better. Uh, this is a meningioma. Uh, to me, this contrast looks like a turn on the light bulb. Uh, with the light bulb, up, light bulb on, it's a lot easier for, t for you to find lesions. And also you can find the relationship of this lesion with vessels uh, versus this uh, non-contrast study. So contrast is our friend. Uh, pretty much uh, uh, it's helpful all the, uh, for most of the situ uh, uh, situations uh, other than acute trauma. or throughout uh, foreign body. Uh, this previous case, uh, the MRI, you can see uh, the uh, optic nerve sheath is distended because of the n uh, the, n the tumor is choking the nerve sheath. The CSF here have nowhere to drain, have difficulty draining back. So this just like this uh, uh, illustration, the nerve sheath is being choked by this tumor. Uh, you see this tumor a lot better with contrast enhancement by MRI this is CAT scan. And CAT scan, yes, you see the tumor better, but uh, it's hard for you to tell the, the optic nerve sheath distension. 
here you see a, a much better MRI and CT scan. Even with contrast, it's hard to tell this fluid distension versus the other side. So MRI is better for soft tissues, and s CAT scan is good for bones. For example, here you can see the bone in the, in the sinus, and which you have trouble uh, finding them uh, here. There's another case. Uh, surgeon's question is, uh, where is the cell diaphragm? We can see there's a lesion in the supracellular region that's compressing the optic chiasm. Patient's nose, eyes, the back. So we have to cut it out. But the problem is, is from the outside referral, this image uh, resolution is not high enough. Not high enough to answer the question of where is the cell diaphragm. Because uh, the surgeon want to know, should he go through the nose, a transphenoidal resection of this tumor, or going through the frontal lobe here? And then we did the high resolution images a, f a few days later, and then find out this little diaf uh, di cell diaphragm right here. So by knowing this, most of the lesion is below the diaphragm, the patient and the doctor decided to go through the nose transphenoidal resection instead of going through the frontal lobe. This little extra information will help to improve the patient's uh, uh, surgical outcome because uh, the do a surgeon have a better map before they go in, so there's less surprises and um, uh, therefore a quicker and easier uh, surgery for the patient. Uh, three Tesla, basically three Tesla MRI is a is high field MRI. Uh, high field MRI result in the higher in, uh, image resolution. The low field MRI, the open MRI usually result in lower res image resolution. Patient like it, it's open, it's, it's not all that open, but it's still open on the side compared to here. But uh, the sacrifice to me is, I, I think it's not worth it. Because the difference is just like a regular definition TV versus high definition TV. It's hard for you to tell anything on, on this grass and where you can see this grass pattern on this uh, high definition TV. Same thing with the brain here. You will see this little extra num lesion here much easier. Uh, I doubt you're going to see it on uh, the uh, low field MRI. Uh, by the way, you uh, you also as a patient, you pay the same for a uh, same kind of study. Doesn't matter what kind of a uh, MRI study, uh, MRI machine was performed on the three three million dollar three T MRI and the three hundred thousand dollar open MRI charge you the same. So uh, CAT scan. Uh, four slice CT versus 64 slice CT, same patient, and then here have too much artifact, which is fake images, streaky, streakiness that you do not see the anatomy well. Yes, uh, but 64 slide you will see it better. So if you see the anatomy better, you will see the pathology better. Here, the pathology and the anatomy are all not seen. If you describe the area of uh, of your concern, tel telling us uh, how to label it, and then we will have a better time uh, answering your question. For example, this patient, um, patient has uh, uh, elbow pain after uh, a baseball injury. When the when the marker was placed here, showing the pains here, we can look carefully. Oh, there is a line, very faint line here. There's a fracture here, very faint line here. We, without it, in the first glance, I cannot find there's any fracture here because the bone was just perfectly aligned. So by t giving us more information, we'll answer your question better. Um, hopefully, uh, a neuroradiologist will give you the interpretation because we have uh, specialized training in brain, head and neck, and spinal imaging. Uh, we uh, read all the radiology have to go through four uh, in the United States go through four years of college at least four years of medical school one year of internship and four year of uh, general diagnostic radiology study all part of the brain <coughs> I'm sorry all part uh, all part of the body and we neuroradiology have one to two extra year of specialization in the brain and head and neck and we have to finish a big test by the and certified by the American Board of Radiology so. Uh, neuroradiology, uh, when we know more, we will see more pathology. If you don't know it, sometimes when your eye can see it, your brain don't get it. So you still cannot uh, find it. Um, 
here's the slides that uh, remind me this time to get to the summary slides. Uh, the patient uh, is looking up that way. <laughs> and uh, I, I reviewed the uh, uh, tools of orbital imaging, reviewed the, uh, the anatomy and pathology, and what we can see, what and then uh, some uh, neural ophthalmology and show you how to use uh, diagnostic imaging uh, in the current uh, era. Uh, basically sent to a uh, ACR accredited facility, good CT, good MRI, specialized uh, specialty read. If you give us good history and describe the area of concern well and uh, give us the option of deciding whether to use contrast or not, and uh, let neuroradiologists to interpret the exam, you will have a um, pretty good uh, uh, answer to your question. Um, I give this talk to my kids' uh, fourth grade uh, class, and uh, they listen to this already, and they, they like it. And I, I thank you for watching it, and I hope you like it too. Uh, thank you. Uh, any question, give me an email. And, uh, Second opinion service, uh, feel free to.